Senator so. Lyons, it being 2 p.m., time for this debate has expired, and we will move on to questions. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today, Tuesday 8 February, and tomorrow, Wednesday 9 February 2022, for medical reasons. In Senator Reynolds is absent. Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Government Services and the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Education and Youth. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Minister, is the aged care system in crisis, yes or no? The Minister for Aged Care Services, uh, <coughs> Minister Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, thank the Senator for the question and uh, uh, attempting to answer it for me. Uh, Mr President, I'm not here to play word games. The aged care sector, the aged care sector is uh, suffering extreme difficulty because of COVID-19, particularly the Omicron uh, strain at the moment. There's been significant commentary with respect to the state of the sector over the last week since Senate estimates last week. And yes, Senator, uh, the Prime Minister made his statements and views known as well. Mr President, my focus is to work to support the sector to help them to get through the current situation. It is extremely difficult, Mr. President, and the work that I've been doing all through uh, the oh, pandemic, no. Mr. President, and let's remember we are in a global pandemic here, is to work with the sector to assist them oh, to, no, get through the, to, to get through Senator the current Watt. situation. Will, Mr. President, uh, the ANMF to take up the interjection from Senator Watt described it as a crisis in 2012 when you were in government. So, Mr. President, so let's. Let's, let's, let's take that. So, so, so some of us remember that, and, and Mr. President, we were the ones that had the courage. We were the ones that had the courage to call a royal commission, no matter how difficult that might have been for us as a government. And we were the ones that have responded comprehensively to the royal commission, Mr. President. And the only response we've had from the Labor Party and Mr. Albanese is that we'll spend more than the other lot. Twelve months after the royal commission's reported, and that's all we've got from Order. Labor, Mr. President. We'll spend more than them, Mr. President. We have, committed, we have committed over $18 billion to reform this sector. We've commenced the process of, we've commenced the process of reforming and legislating the reform Order. through this government, Mr President. So we're not interested in word games. We know how tough it is in the sector now, right now, Mr President, and we're doing everything that we possibly can to assist the sector to work, them, work their way through this extremely difficult environment. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Has the minister told the prime minister that he was wrong when he acknowledged the aged care system was in crisis? Minister, why can't you acknowledge that, uh, Mr. President? Again, as I said, I'm, I'm not interested in playing Labor's uh, word games, Mr. Oh, President. Uh, uh, my focus and the prime minister's focus, I might add. In all of our conversations Order. in relation to aged care is how we assist the sector, work their way, work, work their way through the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. That's been our focus all along. Have we got everything right, Mr President? No, we haven't. And we've admitted that. We've had the courage to admit that. We haven't played nasty personal games like the Labor Party have. We haven't gone down that track. Not a constructive, not a single constructive discussion or contribution from those on the other side, Mr. President. But we have put all of the resources at government uh, towards the support of the aged care sector, and, Mr. President, that's what we will continue to do. That's what we'll continue to do. Uh, we we Order. are very, very on comfortable continuing Senator to work McAllister. cooperatively with the aged care sector, the providers who we talk to on a regular basis, and their peaks in the in the case of Minister, helping them to work their Minister, way through the current situation. Your time has expired. Senator Gallagher, Thank you, a second Mr. supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. While hundreds of older Australians in his care had di have died and more than 1,000 aged care homes were dealing with outbreaks, this minister went to the cricket for three days. Yep. When this minister thinks going to the cricket is more important than protecting elderly Australians in his care, isn't it time the minister resigned? Yep. Minister. Thank you, Mr President. And, and again, uh, Senator Gallagher knows exactly what I was doing um, and when I was doing it, and, and, and she continuously and dishonestly, Mr. President, uh, 
order. dishonestly misinterprets Senator and misrepresents Watt. the circumstance. She knows that I spent most of Friday working on trying to deal with the issues that aged care were facing at the time, including blockages in supply chains that I might admit a, a lot of industry around the country were dealing with that at, at the Order time, which was inhibiting the supply of, of crucial supplies out to rate aged care sectors. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I made some Senator decisions Watt. with respect to uh, the events that I attended over, those, over that period of time, Mr. President, but I was always available and always continued to work Order. in respect of the support of the aged care sector. People will criticise me as they will, Mr. President. I have to take uh, that on the chin, Minister, Mr. President. But I Minister, your time has expired. I am not going to call Senator Bragg until there is silence in the chamber. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is taking action to strengthen the economic recovery and create jobs as we move to the next phase of the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? Order. Order. The Minister representing the Prime Minister. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Bragg for his question, and I know his uh, his relentless focus on how we help Australians through uh, the challenges caused by COVID-19. And globally, we've seen yet another wave uh, of the challenges resulting from COVID-19, just as we see the waves of COVID-19 continue. The most recent waves that have challenged the globe, of course, have been the Omicron wave, seeing huge spike in case numbers right around the world but thankfully a less severe variant than has previously been faced. I want to thank all Australians for what they have done over the past two years, but particularly during the recent summer season in the face of the global challenges of COVID-19. Together, the resilience, the efforts of Australians have achieved remarkable outcomes. Some of the lowest fatality rates in the world, some of the highest vaccination rates in the world, some of the strongest economic outcomes in the world. More than 51 million vaccinations have been applied across our country. More than 90, around 94 per cent of those aged over 16 fully vaccinated, and more than 9 million people having had a booster. Senator now, Mr Senator President, Lines. there are no silver bullets to dealing with COVID-19. We have to continue to work through the ever-changing circumstances. Billy. And as we do that, we are able to continue to work towards the normalisation of the treatment of COVID as we live more effectively with COVID with a highly vaccinated population. From the 21st of February, just 13 days, we will see our international borders reopen to tourists, giving a much needed lift to our tourism industry, a further step in our economic plan that has kept Australians secure in their jobs, kept Australian businesses stronger and has enabled our economy to withstand its biggest test in decades. We are one of only nine countries in the world to still have a AAA credit rating intact even with the spending incurred through COVID. Our inflation is well below that of other advanced economies. Our unemployment rate is at a 13-year low. These economic outcomes are facts, and they're testament to the fact that Australia's policies have worked to help keep Australians safer and more secure. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. What has been the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Australia's employment situation, and what are the expectations for the year ahead? Minister. Mr President, despite all the challenges that have been faced, more Australians are in work today than ever before. More Australians are in work today than ever before. Indeed, 1.7 million additional jobs have been created during the time of our government. Unemployment today stands in its last recorded figures at 4.2 per cent. That, Mr President, is a 13-year low. These are economic outcomes that would very much be the envy of so many other nations of the world. Just one year ago, unemployment was at 6.6 per cent. It's now at 4.2 per cent. We see women's workforce participation at its highest level and more than one million additional Australian women in jobs than was the case uh, when our government was elected. Youth unemployment has fallen to its lowest level since 2008. Again, investment in trades, in apprenticeships, has helped to drive outcomes there, protecting young Australians from the ravages that previous recessions and economic Minister, downturns have inflicted upon them. Your time has expired. Senator Bragg, a second supplementary. Thank you very much. What support is the government providing businesses to allow them to grow and continue to employ Australians? 
Minister. The last two budgets our government has handed down have been focused on the economic recovery plans to keep Australia's businesses strong, safe, secure, to keep Australians in jobs and to help us work through the continued uncertainties of COVID. And they have worked, Mr President, they have worked in terms of supporting those businesses, hundreds of thousands of livelihoods and Australian businesses. Our continued support through tax relief for Australians, more than 11 million Australian families enjoying the benefits of lower income taxes, $1.5 billion a month extra going into the pockets of those Australian households, Mr President. The support of the Home Builder Program and the Home Guarantee Scheme, seeing more than 300,000 Australians helped into home ownership even in these challenging international times. Our $110 billion pipeline of infrastructure projects, the 220,000 trade apprentices in training, these are the consequence of targeted, effective policies that we have put in place to help keep Australians secure. Senator Billock. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. How many Australians in aged care have died from COVID-19 since the 1st of January 2022? The Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, since, since the 1st of January this year, uh, there have been 12,088 infections into residential aged care in Australia. That's residents who have contracted the virus. And, uh, Mr. President, of those, uh, of the latest data that I've received, 587 have passed away, Mr. President. And I might add, might add at this point that. Um, that 12,000, just over 12,000 infections in uh, 2022 is off the back of over 2 million infections in the Australian community. Over 2 mi so, oh, so, so, so that's, uh, that's off the back of over 2 million infections in the Australian community. Uh, and, and, and Mr President, uh, the, the, the interjections from the other side demonstrate that the Labor Party aren't interested in the reality of the, of the circumstance out there. They're only interested Senator in playing their cheap, nasty, dirty personal politics. That's what they do. Um, that's what they're. That's what, Mr. President. And, and can I say, I, I would like to put on the record, Mr. President, here today, um, my thanks and congratulations to the sector and the workforce for the work that they have done um, through the pandemic, and and Mr. President. Their improved performance. Order. Their improved performance, Mr. President. Mr. President. So, in in 2020, 7.5% of infections in this country were in aged care. In 2022, 7.5% of infections were in aged care. This year, Mr. President, that number is 0.6% of infections. Order. And that is a result, Mr. President, of the work that the sector has done in conjunction with government, Mr. President. Uh, that, is, that, that is due to the, the infection control leads that were put in there and funded by the government back in 2020. It's a result of the infection Order. control training that, that uh, aged care workers and providers have put in place. It's, it's, in Minister, it's put in place, Mr Minister, President. your time has expired. Senator Billick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How many Australians in aged care who died from COVID-19 since January had not had their booster shots. Minister, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, as uh, we indicated to the the, um, the committee, COVID committee last week, um, uh, that that data Order. is not available to us at this point in time, because we are because of lags in reporting uh, through the state um, committees of births, deaths, and marriages. To to ensure that we can receive that data, Mr. President, as you've said, Senator Keneally, uh, uh, we've put in place uh, a, a, a group, to, a task force, uh, to pull together that data and provide it to Order. the community, to the Parliament, in a more timely way, Mr. President. It's very important information for us all to understand, Mr. President. Mr. President, but in terms of the boosters, in the context of the boosters, we started the booster program on the 8th of November last year, on the 12th of November or thereabouts, we got advice to bring the dates forward. And on Christmas Eve, Mr. President, we got advice Minister, to bring it forward even further, Minister, which we have done. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Billick, a second. Oh, a point. Uh, 
It's a point of procedure, perhaps. I've noticed that the minister I'll, I'll give you has some regularly latitude, gone over Senator Keneally, Sorry. A, po a, a point. Of, I apologise, Mr. President. A point of order, please. Go ahead, Senator Keneally. Thank you. I, I noticed that the minister has regularly gone over the time, and I'd draw your attention to that. I, I have called the minister at the time of the clock expiring. Senator Billick, second supplementary question. Um, thank you, Mr. President. A task force after 22 negative reports is pretty pathetic, really. Instead of fixing the supply of PPE, fixing workforce shortages, and fixing the booster rollout, this minister, Senator Colbeck, went to the cricket for three days. How many Australians in aged care need to die before this minister, that you, Senator Colbeck, finally accept there's a crisis on his watch and resigns? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. I was going to say it's nice to see Senator Billick back um, after an absence, which it is. Um, thank you for the question. Mr President. Uh, <laughs> What, Mr. President, Mr. President the, the focus of the government all the way through uh, the pandemic has to, been work, to be work with the health system, to work with the aged care sector to support both of those sectors, and that's been one of the foundation Order. elements of our approach to managing the COVID-19 pandemic. It is a pandemic, Mr. President. People will catch the virus, and there will be the out, uh, um, inevitable, unfortunate outcomes of that, Mr. President. Uh, we continue to work every day uh, to clear the issues up that crop up in relation to uh, the pandemic. Mr. President, we've acknowledged publicly that we had some supply chain issues with supply of PPE. We've got uh, additional assistance to the national medical stockpile to support that. Uh, we've, we've supplied over 9 million rats to residential aged care centres since August to support them in their efforts, Mr. Order. President, and we will continue to do that. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. My question is to Senator Birmingham representing the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has said that he's committed to making workplaces safe, but Commissioner Jenkins' earlier report, Respect at Work, made clear that a positive duty on employers is critical to achieving that. Uh, your party voted against that, but then we were told at last estimates that consultation on the positive duty would start in December with a view to implementation by late March. We're now in the second week of February, with only a handful of sitting days before an election, and none of this has happened. How can women in this country have any confidence that this government is committed to making any workplace safe for them? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Waters uh, for her question and uh, and at the commencement. I acknowledge that. Uh, uh, that my colleague, uh, Senator Cash, and, uh, and the government have been pursuing action across a range of areas in implementing uh, recommendations from the Respect at Work report, uh, a very valuable and important piece of work undertaken by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner uh, in terms of uh, advancing um, uh, equality uh, and opportunity across Australian workplaces, and the government's comprehensive response there has been uh, released. Uh, Senator Waters' question you relate specifically to Recommendation 17, the, uh, the positive duty uh, recommendation, which the government has been clear uh, we believe requires further consultation to, uh, to assess how such a duty would operate effectively alongside existing duties that already exist under various work, health and safety laws uh, and, indeed, under the Sex Discrimination Act. Uh, including the duties to ensure that additional complexity is not created for those seeking to use such protections. Uh, so we are working through those, uh, those consultation processes uh, to make sure uh, that any changes uh, that are put in place operate as intended and do not result in unnecessary duplication, confusion or uncertainty, uh, either for uh, employers or employees. Uh, the vicarious liability provisions in the Sex Discrimination Act and model work health and safety laws already place uh, I'm advised a positive duty on employers to protect workers from health and safety risks, including psychosocial risks such as sexual harassment, uh, so far as that is reasonably practicable. Employers must therefore already take reasonable and preventative steps, such as implementing appropriate policies oh, and oh, providing. Minister, please resume your seat. Is this a point of order? Yes, order? reluctantly, um, President. I, I did go to the question of timing. I'm aware of everything else you've said, but I'm interested. You said consultation would be done and it would be implemented by March. 
Where is Senator it? Senator Waters, you've brought the minister's attention back to part of the question. The minister was being directly relevant to other parts of the question. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. As I indicated, my understanding is the consultation is uh, is underway. Uh, I'm not advised in terms of any uh, uh, variations around timelines or the like on that matter. But we are certainly working through that process uh, as the other recommendations of respect Minister, work continue to be pursued. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks very much, President. This morning's statement committed to listening to survivors and staff. But the Prime Minister is reportedly not going to listen to Grace Tame or Brittany Higgins at the press club tomorrow. He's not even going to watch it on the telly. How can women in this country have any confidence that this government will actually listen to survivors? Do you think Australian women even believe a word the Prime Minister says anymore? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, you know, these are uh, important matters, and important matters that I would hope could uh, could exist and be discussed uh, above cheap political pot shots or uh, uh, or point scoring, uh, such as uh, as occurs in the question there uh, from Senator Waters. Uh, I have uh, no doubt, Mr. President, uh, no doubt that the Prime Minister uh, will indeed uh, be uh, be seeking to ensure he understands the messages and views that are conveyed. Uh, in tomorrow's press club address, uh, as he does in terms of other statements of importance that are made uh, across the country. Uh, he recognises the, uh, the important work around respect at work, uh, which is why, under Prime Minister Morrison, our government has been pursuing uh, the vast majority of those recommendations. Some 42 of the 55 recommendations under respect at work have either been fully implemented or fully funded and work is underway on all remaining recommendations. As we discussed this morning, it is now in relation Minister, to that other report of Minister, Kate Jenkins your set time standard. has expired. Senator Waters, a second supplementary question. Thank you, President. Despite government commitments that survivors would be invited to today's statement of acknowledgement address, we have heard from a number of survivors who participated in the review who did not know about the statement until they heard about it in the media. This is not acceptable. What went wrong? And what message do you think that sends survivors? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Well, Senator Waters, I, I thank you earlier today, as I did everybody else across the chamber, uh, for the constructive way in which we engaged in these matters. Uh, I'm disappointed uh, in relation to that question, that you would raise it in that way. Uh, as I have said publicly today, uh, my office asked the Australian Human Rights Commission last week uh, to contact uh, all those that they had contact details for who had participated in Commissioner Jenkins's review. My understanding is that they did that, uh, Senator. That is my understanding. Uh, now, I can't speak for contacting those individuals because, as you well know, we put in place legal protections for all of those who participated. So the government had no way of contacting all of those who participated in the review. We did, as you knew I had said we would do. And as I had said publicly we would do, which was to ask the AHRC to do that, and my advice is that's what they did. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and National Government economic plan is delivering new jobs across Australia? Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for the question. And Mr. President, this government, the Morrison government, we are a job-creating government. And when you look at the labour force figures in December, they were positive news for all Australians. They show that new businesses and new jobs are being created right across the country. Mr. President, this government's economic plan has always been based around getting Australians into work, creating jobs and getting Australians off welfare and into work. And that is exactly what's happening as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. When you look at the evidence in relation to the employment figures, the unemployment rate has decreased to 4.2 per cent. That is now lower than when we came into office in 2013. The participation rate, that's Australians putting their hands up and saying, I'm ready, willing and able to work. It continues to be strong, remaining steady at 66.1 per cent. More than 60,000 jobs were created in the month 
of December. And that, of course, is because of those fantastic employers across Australia. What that means is that employment is now at a record high in Australia, with 13,242,000 Australians in work. There are, in fact, now 246,600 Australians in work than there was prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. When you look to the employment to population ratio, that itself has increased to 63.3 per cent. And underemployment, people often ask about underemployment. That has now decreased, that is a good thing, to 6.6 per cent. So, Mr President, when we talk about putting in place the right policies, uh, the right policies so that businesses out there can prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians, the statistics speak for Minister, themselves. Your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise how the government is helping young Australians find a job? Minister. Mr President, the government has been acutely focused on ensuring the scarring impact recessions have on young Australians were not felt in the COVID-19 induced recession. Senator we've invested Watt. heavily, we've invested heavily, as we know, and quite proudly, into the skills and training system. That has, of course, helped businesses to retain staff because quite often it's the young person the apprentice that is the first person let to go. and We've ensured that by our investment in the skills and training system, employers have been able to keep those young people and those apprentices on. And this, of course, further supports that pipeline of workers in Australia. We have invested by way of the boosting apprenticeship commencement wage subsidy, the supporting apprenticeship and training wage subsidy. And again, this has now ensured that Order. more Australians, more Australians, have trade apprenticeships than ever before in recorded history. That is a good thing, Mr President, but it is because Minister, of the investments made Minister, by the coalition government. Your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin. How is the government's plan helping Australians who want to work and secure employment? Minister. Well, Mr President, again, when you look at the evidence based on the policies that the coalition government have put in place, when we look at where we were at the outset of COVID-19 and where we are today, if you recall at the outset of COVID-19, Treasury was modelling at the height of COVID-19 that unemployment could potentially go as high as 15 per cent. What they were saying was two million Australians could have been out of work. And then you look at the policy response from the coalition government. Look at where we are now. In December 2021, the unemployment rate has dropped to 4.2 per cent. We're at near record high participation. That is a good thing. Over $300 billion in health and economic support provided through our economic plan has helped us to reach this point. Mr President, it is because of the policies put in place by the coalition government Minister, that Australians Minister, are in work. your time has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Since 1 January this year, Jeddah Gardens Aged Care Home, south of Brisbane, has experienced a major COVID-19 outbreak. Fifteen residents have died, and a total of 100 residents and 82 staff have tested positive. When did booster vaccines first start being administered at Jeddah Gardens? The Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, <coughs> Senator Watt is right. There has been a quite a significant outbreak um, at uh, Jetta Gardens, unfortunately, and the, uh, the numbers that he's quoted in his question are the latest figures that I've had. Unfortunately, Mr. President, uh, I'm able to say that the situation at Jetta Gardens has stabilised. There was a lot of concern over the weekend, and uh, Mr. President, uh, I am cognisant of the question, Senator White, so I'm not trying to. But, but Mr. President, there was a lot of concern over the weekend at Jetta Gardens when somebody quite irresponsibly, quite irresponsibly started a rumour that the facility was to be evacuated by the Defence Force. It caused a huge media Order. storm. Order. Mr President, this, Order. This, this is an important point because it's caused enormous distress, distress to the families. 
Mr. President. Uh, the booster clinic, I'll, give, I'll deal with the booster clinic and I'll deal with the rest of it, Mr. President. The booster clinic uh, scheduled and brought forward from its original date uh, at Jetta Gardens occurred on the 31st of January, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President. And, and of course, uh, there are a number of other methods through which aged care residents uh, can uh, get a booster shot. They can, they can have a GP. They can get a GP or a pharmacist to come and do it, Mr. President. Uh, they can do uh, attend a, a GP clinic, Mr. President. So, aside from the, the or the facility can run its own uh, clinic and will pay for the, the cost of that, Mr. President. Uh, but I just want to go back to the point that I've made because it's a serious one. The distress caused to the families by the irresponsible, the clearly irresponsible rumours that were started Order. in Queensland. Uh, at the weekend is, is outrageous. Fanned, might I say, by the opposition. Fanned by the opposition, irresponsibly. Uh, unfortunately, reported by the media before being. Uh, Mr. President. Minister, uh, Minister, uh, your time has expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In damning reports issued in March and September last year, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission found that care at Jetta Gardens failed to meet aged care quality standards, including the safety of res residents' care and the facility's preparedness for a COVID-19 outbreak. Why did the minister fail to take urgent action last year in response to his own regulators' repeated findings of non-compliance? Minister. Order. Thank you, Mr. Minister, Mr. President. Your seat. Senator Watt to interject before the minister has even had a chance to answer the question is highly disorderly. Minister, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the, the, regulator, the regulator throughout this pandemic has done its job, which is what it did last year, Mr. President. And the regulator worked with Jetta Gardens to bring them back to compliance. That's the role that they do, Mr. President. Senator Watt. Mr. Mr. Senator President, Watt. that is the role that the regulator has, Mr. President. That is the role that the regulator has, and and uh, the regulator has taken further regulatory action, Mr. President, in relation to Jetta Gardens. Senator um, and, Watt. and the government has taken additional uh, assistance uh, measures as well, Mr. President, uh, as the as the uh, outbreak progressed. Yes. Clinical first Senator responders Watt. and an Aspen team in there to support the facility in relation to their, their infection control procedure and their processes within the, in the facility, Mr. President. So we have continuously monitored the facility and we've put in place the measures and the additional resources that have been required to support the facility through Minister, the outbreak. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Watt, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. This minister has ignored repeated warnings about workforce shortages PPE shortages and ignored the alarming failures at Jetta Gardens exposed by two reports in the last 12 months. And now 15 residents have died and 100 residents and 82 staff had tested positive. When will this minister resign? Minister. Mr President, uh, over the course of the pandemic, the government has continued to work with the sector to support it with respect to the measures that need to be and the advice and the measures that need to be put in place to manage uh, COVID-19 through the pandemic. And Mr. President, as I've indicated in an earlier question today, the sector has performed Order. extremely well in the context of the number of infections in aged care compared to those in the broader community. Uh, the I, my, my, my thanks and my congratulations again go to the sector and the workforce who have done a magnificent job in managing this, Mr. President. Uh, we continue to work. Uh, with the Quality Commission to ensure that all providers, that all providers meet the quality standards. That's the role uh, that the Quality Commission has, and it continues Order. to work uh, on that in that sense, Mr. President. Of course, uh, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic have been absolutely tragic, and I extend again my condolences to all of those who have lost loved ones as, Minister, as a result of the pandemic. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting the economic prosperity of Australian women as we reopen the economy? The Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Chandler for her question and her enduring commitment to women's economic security, which reflects the enduring commitment of the Morrison government. In fact, the Morrison government's economic plan is clearly working. Today, there are over more, more than one million more women in work than when we came to government. Let me say that again more than one million more women in work under a coalition Liberal National Government. Now, this is not something that happens by accident. It can only have been made possible because of the economic policies that have been put in place intentionally by this government. We currently have the highest, the highest women's employment to population ratio than Australia has ever seen before. More Australian Order. women in work than ever before. Women's workforce participation is hovering at record levels, and women's underemployment is steadily heading consistently down. All of this achieved with the background of a global pandemic. Importantly, there are more opportunities for Australian women to work, to take up an apprenticeship, to upskill, to reskill, to start a business, and to take on those Senator better McAllister. and higher paying jobs than ever before. And our government's commitment to enhancing Senator the economic Keneally. security of Australian women extends well beyond economic management. In the 2020-21 budget, we made a landmark commitment and investment of $1.9 billion to improve the affordability oh, of childcare by increasing the childcare subsidy for families with multiple children, for women who want to return to the workforce to take on training, to take on study or to volunteer, their decision to, ta to take on childcare, on to, to reduce the cost of childcare is made more, uh, more affordable for them. But improving women's economic security is only part of the goal, Mr. President. On top of, uh, on top of our economic policy. Oh, Minister, mm -hmm. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister outline to the Senate how the government is securing the economic future of Australian women? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I can. Let's be clear. From skills, from to childcare, from leadership to board appointments, and most importantly, to job opportunities, we are backing Australian women to get the choices and chances that they deserve, that we deserve. Australian women can rest assured that this government's economic plan will maximise opportunities as we continue to recover from the pandemic. I can certainly promise you, I can certainly promise you, Mr. President, that they. We won't be slugging them with higher taxes. We won't be proposing a retiree tax, for Order. instance, damaging their retirement Senator savings. Senator we certainly Keneally. won't be bringing in $387 billion of new or higher taxes, smashing their jobs and robbing women of opportunities. And while the childcare subsidy is currently up to 95 per cent for those families with two or more children who want to work who want to study or who want to volunteer, we certainly won't be bringing in free childcare for millionaires while regular women work longer and longer hours to pay the taxes to pay for Minister, such a scheme. Get order. Order. Senator Chandler, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister can the minister explain the importance of a collaborative approach across government and industry in reducing barriers to improve women's economic security? Minister. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. So the Morrison government recognises that improving measures like the gender pay gap requires a commitment and a targeted policy and a, and a partnership between industry and between government, between the private sector and Order. all levels of government. But before I talk about what's ahead, let's talk about what is in the rearview mirror. 17.4 per cent gender pay gap when we came to office. Now, now Order. it's 14.2 per cent. But there's more to do. There is no doubt about that. And as a government, we believe in policies that actually shift the dial. Policies not put in place for show, like your Order policy to give millionaires free childcare, but policies with genuine substance. That's why the Women's Budget Statement this year committed to a full review of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to ensure to determine how government can further work alongside the private sector to collectively close the gender pay gap. The Gender Equality Act requires that employers with more than 100 employees Minister, can be required to report to the gender equality. Minister, oh, your goodness time me, I didn't get it out. Has expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for Minister for Finance, Minister Birmingham. 
Minister, there are 75 politicians up here right now who own a second home in Canberra. Each and every one of them can claim the full rate of travel allowance, nearly 300 bucks, to sleep in the comfort of their own bed this evening. That's $20,000 in free money going out to 75 politicians tonight alone. I reckon it should be illegal for politicians to claim full travel allowance to sleep in their own bed. It's not allowed anywhere else in the country, so why should Canberra be any different? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Lambie, for the question. Uh, Mr. President, um, the, uh, the rates of travel allowance and arrangements for travel allowance are set independently through the Remuneration Tribunal. It's been a long-standing practice that, in relation to the rates paid for members and senators uh, to stay in Canberra, that uh, relative to uh, the rates paid in other capital cities, there is a discounted rate applied in Canberra. Uh, recognising and indeed uh, encouraging members and senators to make uh, longer-term uh, arrangements in relation to uh, their accommodation in Canberra. Now, that's a private matter for each uh, member and senator to undertake, uh, but, uh, but the government stands by the independent process of the Remuneration Tribunal on these matters. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I think we get that. No one is breaking any rules here. Politicians are allowed to claim full travel allowance to stay in their investment properties in Canberra. I'm not denying that. But as the Finance Minister, do you seriously have no problem with politicians using travel allowance to pay their own mortgages and then come out with a nice hit at the end when they leave Parliament? Do you Minister. have no issues with that? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, um, uh, I'd simply make the observation, uh, as I indicated in the primary answer, uh, that the rate that is applied for uh, for overnight stays in Canberra is uh, is assessed in a slightly different way by the REM Tribunal compared with the rate uh, for uh, for commercial accommodation provision in other capital cities uh, of Australia. Um, so, in terms of uh, the cost effectiveness for the government's finances, Senator Lambie, uh, it would concern me. Uh, were we in a situation that changes were made that indeed potentially increased the cost by increasing the nightly rate uh, that, uh, that was paid. So, uh, so again, I back the independent processes there to uh, seek to find uh, the right uh, approach to, uh, to um, respect taxpayers' dollars, to minimise costs where possible, but to ensure uh, that, uh, that uh, indeed recompense is made to, to enable members and senators to make their own arrangements for overnight accommodation as is necessary in Canberra. Senator Lambie, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, Anthony Albanese, no one's getting an inch here, by the way, billed taxpayers $17,000 in travel allowance to stay in his Canberra flat while Sydney was in lockdown last year. He says he has no plans to change the rules either. He doesn't see a need to. So I just wanted to clarify this. To the best of your knowledge that the Liberal Party, the Nationals and the Labor Party are on a unit ticket uh, because of uh, because of their own self sense of self entitlement when it comes to claiming this money from the taxpayer. Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I uh, reject the assertions made there, Senator Lambie. Um, what we are indeed backing is an independent process uh, that has been in place for many years uh, for, uh, for the Remuneration Tribunal to make independent assessments at arm's length from uh, politicians uh, that uh, we are not. Uh, I am not as finance minister. Uh, Mr Morton is not a special minister of state responsible for setting uh, the rates, terms or arrangements uh, for travel allowances. It is, of course, the fact uh, that every one of us here, aside from uh, Senator Gallagher and Senator Seselja, um, travel here uh, away from our homes, and perhaps Senator Molan, yes, uh, Senator Molan, uh, travel here away from our homes, uh, do, of course, then incur costs of some form or other in relation to the accommodation while we were here. Uh, as I said, it's been a long-standing practice the REM Tribunal has applied in terms of the flexibility of that, uh, but that is also reflected in the different rates as they are calculated, uh, and that's why the independent approach is the appropriate approach. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. When former New South Wales Liberal Premier Mike Baird and the current CEO of Hammond Care called for the ADF to be employed to aged care homes to assist with the staffing crisis on the 12th of January, Mr Morrison rebuked this suggestion, saying Defence Force personnel were, and I quote, not a shadow workforce. Just 26 days later, Mr Morrison backflipped. 
Isn't this just another example of the Morrison-Joyce government doing too little too late? Uh, the Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr Order. President. Um, and, uh, Mr President, uh, it's a pity that the good senator wasn't listening to what the Prime Minister said yesterday, because yesterday the Prime Minister reaffirmed that the Defence Force is not a shadow workforce for any workforce in this country, but particularly for the aged care workforce. What the, announcement, what the announcement that we made yesterday was, Mr President, was to pull together some targeted support for aged care facilities that were in significant distress, Mr President. That's what we announced yesterday, and to, and to build teams in each state to support providers in each state. The, the, the Defence Force is not a shadow workforce. It is not a shadow workforce. Uh, the Prime Minister said that uh, in, when, the, when the, the proposal was first put on the table, and he repeated Order. it again yesterday, Mr President. So it would be nice if Labor senators opposite actually took notice of what was happening rather than just playing their politics, exploiting the pandemic rather than doing what we're doing, which is dealing with the pandemic, Mr President. So, Mr President, we continue to work with the sector to provide them with the resources that they need in support of their management of the pandemic. Important decisions like the advice that the Chief Medical Officer made early in January so that more work staff could go back to work quickly and safely uh, in support of the residents in the residential aged care facilities. A significant decision, Mr President, that has Order. made a real difference in the capacity of, of the aged care sector and facilities in particular to maintain their workforce and support residents. The supply of rapid antigen tests, which are now going to every aged care facility in the country, Mr President, 2.5 of them dispatched last week in support of the, um, of the, the facilities that have an outbreak the facilities that are, have contact and the facilities that require them for screening, Mr. President. The supply of PPE, where there were some issues coming out of the national stockpile, which we acknowledged, and we provided additional resources to support the sector Minister, in respect of those. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. What a disgrace. How many older Senator Australians Ayers. in residential aged care died in the 26 days it took for the Morrison Joyce government to listen to the warnings? and to finally act. Minister. Mr President, I completely reject the premise of the question in the context that the Prime Minister said that it wasn't a shadow workforce. It isn't a shadow workforce, Mr President. And, 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 and we still say it's not a shadow workforce. The measure that we introduced yesterday, Mr President, was a targeted approach to support particular facilities that are in significant levels of stress with respect to workforce. That's what we're doing. We're not providing a shadow workforce, Mr President, as that lot over there dishonestly try to imply. That's not what Order we're doing, Mr. On President. My lap. Mr. President. And yes, unfortunately, over the course of the Minister, pandemic. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Ayres. The point of order is relevant. The question was very direct. Over the course of the 26 days, how many older Australians died in the residential aged care system for which the minister is responsible? The minister directly addressed your question at the start of his question. I believe his answer has been directly relevant to the question. The minister has 18 seconds remaining. Minister, I am listening to the remainder of your answer. You have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I haven't done a calculation on. I, I, I'm based on who died on what day and who died on another day, Mr. President. And as I told the Senate committee last week, there is actually a lag in the data. Uh, unfortunately, there is a lag in the data, and that's been demonstrated by some jumps in figures over the period of time. But we continue Minister, to work closely with the sector Minister, in support of them through the pandemic. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Ayres, a second thank, supplementary thank question. Thank you, Mr. President. If, if the minister can't answer that question, how many older Australians were locked in their rooms without a wash for days? How many were left in soiled pads? How many were left with untended wounds? How many were left unfed and neglected? In the 26 days it took for the Morrison-Joyce government and this minister to listen to the warnings and finally act. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. 
And if anyone ever wanted an, an example of how the Labor Party are exploiting the pandemic rather than dealing with the pandemic, which is what we're doing, Mr. President, there's an example of it in that question, Mr. President. What a disgrace, and Mr. Order. President! What a complete disgrace! You should be ashamed Order. of yourself, Senator Ayres. You should be ashamed, Mr. President. The aged, the, aged, the aged care sector is under extreme stress in this country. We've acknowledged that. The Prime Minister, Order. all of us from the Prime Minister down, have acknowledged that. And we continue to work with the sector in support of them, and most importantly, the residents that are in the aged care, in aged care facilities. And, Mr. President, the catastrophic. Uh, approach that the, cas cas the, the approach that the Labor Party is taking, Mr. President, to uh, demonising the sector and the effects, are making it very, very difficult, Mr. President, for us to strike the appropriate balance about having residents Order. having visitors or not having visitors and being locked in their rooms. So, Mr. President, their Minister. approach is actually hurting Minister. residents in aged care, not helping them. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Uh, Minister, we've recently seen some extensive Order. flooding across Australia, including in my state around Griffith in the Riverina, to the north of the state in Queensland, Western Australia and South Australia, to the point that we have seen disruptions to our freight supply chains, as well as incredible damage to a lot of small businesses and farmers. Order. Can the minister update the Senate on what the Liberal and Nationals government is doing to support communities affected by these flooding events and severe weather across the country? Order, Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Order, Senator Watt. The Minister for Order in the Chamber. The Minister for Emergency Services, Senator McKenzie. Uh, emergency that, Management, sorry. That's so good. It's a very long title. Um, it's uh, great to be back. And thank you so much, Senator Davey, for the question. Um, with the La Nina, the floods that have uh, swept across, particularly the east coast of our nation over the last three months, have been catastrophic and devastating, including uh, the loss of so many lives. We stand shoulder to shoulder with affected communities and individuals uh, as they make, through, make their way through natural disasters, respond and recover and build natural resilience uh, into the future. We've got the $85 million natural uh, hazard research Australia um, money. We've got $40 million dedicated to strata resilience, the North Queensland flood recovery. We're able to put $1.58 billion on the table. $2.8 billion has been committed to the bushfire recovery. $600 million for preparing Australia to uh, better respond to natural disasters in the future, $13 billion alone from this government to assist impacted workers uh, through the COVID response, through both the pandemic leave disaster payment and the COVID disaster Order. payment. Our government has put $12 billion in conjunction with states and territories uh, to support these affected communities from natural disaster. In fact, no government in our nation's history has stood with Australians Order. in times of need like the Liberal National Government. Through bushfires, cyclones, earthquakes and floods and COVID, this government has been providing boots on the ground and financial assistance to both individuals and communities to help them at their time of crisis. We're helping people recover funding for cleanups financial assistance for small businesses and primary producers. The last three months alone, we've activated assistance for natural disasters 20 times, uh, with $50,000 grants Minister, for primary producers. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Can you also explain to the Senate how our government is utilising the Emergency Response Fund and strengthening Australia's emergency response and disaster preparedness so that we're ready for them instead of waiting for them to happen. Minister. Well, thank you Order. very much, Senator. And we do live in the country of droughts and flooding rains. The next natural disaster is simply around uh, the corner. And in this country, we spend 97 per cent 
of our money and effort on responding to a natural disaster and only 3 per cent in uh, preparing for the next one. Our government has fundamentally flipping uh, the response of the federal government in this country to get ahead of Order. that. And the Labor government is playing games and politicking with the Emergency Response Fund. It is being used and spent in exactly the way it was designed, in fact, in exactly the way the Labor Party voted for it to be used and spent. The fundamental issue they seem to forget is this is a future fund. Order. And this side Senator of politics Watt. has not seen a future fund that they cannot wait to raid, that they cannot wait to spend in the here and now. They're salivating to get their hands on it, instead of actually ensuring this money is put away to prepare Minister, for catastrophic Minister, disasters Minister, in our nation's future. Minister, Sorry, Minister, your time has expired. There was a lot of noise in the chamber, Senator Keneally. There was an excess of interjections in the chamber from one side of politics. Senator Davey, a second supplementary question. Thank you very much. Finally, can the minister please outline how the government is mitigating disaster risk and building our national resilience? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we're not just focused on recovery. The Liberal Nationals government is also focused on mitigating disaster and building our resilience. We're the first government to have dedicated an entire agency with a sole focus to ensure we are prepared as we can Senator be for natural Watt. disasters, built on solid research and science, and that's the NRRA. The government's national climate resilience and adaptation strategy positions Australia to better anticipate and adapt to climate variability, improving climate information and services to contribute to our future disaster preparedness. Under our government, $210 million has been invested uh, to ensure that the Australian Climate Services was stood up, to use world-leading expertise and focus on supporting the NRRA and Emergency Management Australia to support decisions related to preparedness, response and community recovery from disaster. And we've got the PAP program, the Natural Minister, Flood Minis Mitigation Minister, Infrastructure Program. Minister, your time has expired. Yes. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment, uh, Senator Hume. Experts have warned that without urgent action, koalas will become extinct by 2050. Loss of habitat, climate change and extreme weathers are the biggest threats to our koala population. Yet the Environment Minister has signed off on projects like the Brandy Hill quarry expansion, the Vickery coal mine expansion and even the rail line to Adani that will decimate koala habitat and make climate change even worse. Why is this so-called Minister for the Environment Order. putting the interests of mining companies and their big developer Order. mates ahead Order of our koalas right. and our environment? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and, uh, and I, I thank Senator Hanson Young for her question. Mr President, the Morrison government is taking action and investing $50 million over four years to boost the long-term protection and recovery efforts for koalas. This investment will protect and restore koala habitat. It will improve our understanding of koala populations. It will strengthen research into koala health and support training in koala care and treatment. Now, this new package takes the Morrison government's investment in koala recovery to more than $74 million dollars since 2019. Mr President, the uh, Threatened Species Scientific Committee has been undertaking a reassessment of the status of the listed koala following the impacts of bushfires and in addition to other threats such as land clearing, dogs, cars and disease. The Minister for the Environment, Minister Lee, is currently considering the advice within statutory timeframes. The draft national plan for the listed a koala has been revised in response to the submissions provided during the public comment period, and the government intends to formally make that plan um, uh, to formally make that plan as, uh, public as soon as possible. By working together with state and territory governments, with researchers, with land managers, with veterinarians, with community groups, we can all protect the koala for generations to come. 
Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Prime Minister's package means nothing if the Morrison government keeps signing off on the destruction, uh, the land clearing, and the bulldozing of koala habitat. They can't be saved if they have no homes. When will this government back the Greens bill for a moratorium on the destruction of koala habitat? No home, no koala. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. The Morrison government's $74 million investment spans a range of threats and challenges for the koala, and that includes habitat protection. The management of habitat protection and land clearing are primarily the responsibilities of state governments, but where there are potential impacts on matters of national environmental significance, including the, the clearance of koala habitat, these may in fact require separate Commonwealth approval. The Commonwealth will thus continue to play a leadership role and to support the coordination of conservation outcomes for the koala across its range. The Morrison government's $74.3 million over six years, between 2019 and 2024-25, into projects that are benefiting koalas both directly and indirectly include $47 million to protect and restore the important koala habitat. $8.3 million for koala health genetics research and medical support, and an additional $12 million for the koala National Minister, Koala Monitoring Program. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. No amount of cute photo opportunities with the Prime Minister is going to save Australia's koala population. When will this government finally, finally declare koalas endangered as the science is requiring and to do something properly? seriously to actually save their homes. Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Well, one of the things that Hanson Young that uh, the Morrison government did early on after the 2019-20 bushfires was to talk to an independent panel of experts about the needs of koala. The Minister Order. for the Environment requested at that time that the spe Threatened Species Scientific Committee undertake an assessment of the status of the species. Now, that Threatened Species Scientific Committee has undertaken their assessment of the species and she is currently considering their, their final advice in line with the statutory timeframes. In the meantime, there are projects to benefit the koala that are already well underway. The landmark National Koala Monitoring Program, which is filling key, key data gaps and will produce a robust estimate of the national koala population and monitor the health and condition of koalas. The habitat restoration and mitigation, threat mitigation programs that I spoke of earlier in key koala hotspots in New South Wales and Queensland that focus on both bushfire and non-bushfire affected areas. And it includes a partnership with the World Wildlife Fund that is delivering habitat restoration projects in northern rivers of New South time. Wales and South Minister, East Queensland. Minister, sorry, your time has expired. Senator Birmingham. Uh, Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, I also, Mr. President, seek leave to move a motion to vary the routine of business for today and uh, to enable additional time this evening for the consideration of the Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform Maves Law Bill 2021. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senate. I move the motion as circulated today that would provide for uh, Maeve's Law Bill second reading speeches to continue until 10 p.m. this evening or at the conclusion of the second reading debate, uh, whichever is earlier, uh, noting that there would be no divisions after 7.20 p.m. Senator, can... you're seeking to speak or are we just going to put the motion? Senator McKim, are you seeking to speak? I, I am president, yes. Is leave granted? Do, uh, I seek leave to, to make a 15-second contribution. Oh, no, you can speak. Well, in that case, uh, I will just kick. I'll crack into it, President. Um, <laughs> uh, look, as I indicated, very. You are time limited, but uh, go ahead. As I indicated, President, very, very briefly, we won't be opposing uh, this motion. We do understand uh, the need for it, and we don't want to stand in the way uh, of that important legislation being debated. We just wanted to express our concern that one of the um, effects of this motion will be that we lose the open-ended adjournment debate this evening. Um, now, uh, we would ask the government please to consider uh, uh, by um, another motion tomorrow to restore the open-ended adjournment debate to tomorrow evening rather than this evening, and the government will you know, make their own response to that. But I just wanted to be clear from the Greens' point of view, even though we're not going to oppose this motion, we are concerned that, in effect, it means the loss of a significant 
uh, adjournment uh, opportunity for all senators to make uh, contributions on the adjournment debate. Thank you, Senator Kim. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Keneally. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the performance of the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services. Is leave granted? No. Uh, leave is not granted, Senator Keneally. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in the name of Senator Wong, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a mo motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to the performance of the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services. Let me be clear. From the outset, Senator Richard Colbeck has repeatedly demonstrated over a prolonged period of time that he is incapable of fulfilling the task of looking after the interests of older, vulnerable Australians. For this matter alone, this minister should resign. And if he does not have the decency to resign, the integrity to resign, the self-awareness to resign, the Prime Minister should sack him. And if the Prime Minister will not sack this minister, then he confirms he does not have the character to lead this nation. Our aged care sector is in crisis, an absolute crisis. The third year of this pandemic, Almost 12,000 aged care residents and workers infected with COVID in more than 1,100 facilities as of Friday, and over 600 deaths amongst aged care residents this year. Tens of thousands of aged care residents still waiting for a booster dose. Aged care facilities left without rapid antigen tests and PPE. Aged care residents left without food, without food, water, medical care. Because the government, in the third year of a pandemic, after last year's diabolical handling of COVID and aged care, failed to learn, failed to plan, this government always acts too little too late and only acts when there's an absolute crisis on its hands. An absolute crisis. We have had hundreds of Australians in aged care die of COVID. How many were preventable? if only this aged care minister had acted. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that the Morrison-Joyce government had ignored aged care. It's all there in one word, neglect. That is not my word. That is the word chosen by the Royal Commission into Aged Care to title their interim report, neglect. This is a government that has neglected older citizens in aged care before the pandemic, neglected them in the pandemic, and continues to neglect them to this day. We had a clarion call from the former Liberal Premier of New South Wales, Mike Baird, now CEO of Hammond Care, begging this government to send in the Australian Defence Force 26 days ago. The Prime Minister rejected it. This minister rejected it. This minister said the sector was performing exceptionally well. Those were his words. And he felt so relaxed and comfortable about the aged care sector that he toddled off to the cricket for three days. Well, he probably did get booed, Senator Billick. You make an excellent point. He, should, he got booed at the cricket and he should get booted out of his job. It is an absolute absolute disgrace, an utter disaster, disease running rampant through under-resourced facilities, too few staff to care for those living there, our greatest generation left unwashed and without food. Have you no shame? Have you no responsibility? Have you no care? What happened to ministerial responsibility under this government? Where has it gone? Was it ever there? For if Richard Colbeck can have job security under this government, it is absolutely clear there is almost nothing you can fail at and still be confident to retain your job under Mr. Morrison. Who takes no responsibility? Who tried to blame the states for the outbreaks of COVID in aged care? Who tried to blame other people? He was warned, by the way, on rapid antigen tests. So many people warned him. Katie Allen warned him. Call was coming from inside the house, by the way. The business community warned him. The Transport Workers Union warned him. 
He was warned we need rapid antigen tests, and just like his it's not a race approach to vaccines, it was not a race to get those rapid antigen tests. Failing older Australians, leaving them behind. And to those people who say, what would it do to change the minister? It would send a clear message that this government gives a brass wazoo about older people in aged care. Let somebody else, anybody else, have responsibility for this portfolio because surely nobody could do as bad a job as the incompetent aged care minister. The crisis, the word, the C word he dares not utter, the absolute crisis in aged care. The Prime Minister has acknowledged it, that there is a crisis. The Prime Minister backflipped and sent in the ADF. The next thing the Prime Minister needs to do is sack the Minister for Aged Care. Thank you, Senator Keneally. And I just remind you, when referring to those in the other place, to use their correct titles and equally for senators. Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Well, Deputy President, we have yet another example that it's all politics and zero policy from those opposite, that it's all personality attacks and little, of course, focusing on the substance of issues that need to be addressed, Mr President. When you listen to those opposite, Deputy President, you'd be forgiven for thinking that there is some sort of alternate universe that Australia could operate in, an alternate universe in which COVID could be locked in a box and just kept away somehow, an alternate universe in which Omicron was not a significant global game-changer as it is. But that's not true, Deputy President. That is not the reality of the world in which we face. We face a global pandemic, a highly infectious global pandemic, a global pandemic which has produced new variants, new variants that have become more infectious, more transmissible, and through that created new challenges. They have, however, Deputy President, in terms of those uh, variants, become, thankfully, less lethal, less likely to lead to severe hospitalisation and severe health outcomes. We can be grateful for that, Deputy President. But the reality is COVID is spreading throughout the world. Omicron has seen a huge surge in caseload right throughout the world, and no country has demonstrated, Deputy President, that when you have Omicron and COVID spreading throughout your community, you're going to be able to somehow keep it out completely of different sectors of your community, such as the aged care sector. Now, Deputy President, rather than denigrate the aged care sector, rather than denigrate aged care workers, our government, I want to, I know Minister Colbeck does, thanks them, Deputy President. This motion that Senator Keneally has you know, moved today, Deputy President, does it thank aged care workers anywhere in this motion? No, it doesn't, Senator. Does it thank aged care operators any in the, anywhere in this motion? No, it doesn't. Does it acknowledge? Does it acknowledge the circumstances? No, it's just a political diatribe, typical of the Labor Party, Deputy President. Order. A political Order. diatribe that we're seeing there. If there were a silver bullet, Deputy President, if there were a silver bullet to address the challenges in aged care in dealing with COVID-19 and Omicron, then not only, of course, would we have sought to deliver that as a government, but it might have provided a policy idea for those opposite, because they've shown no policy idea in the aged care sector to date. Not a single policy idea from those Order. opposite, Deputy President. Our government, Deputy President, our government has ensured 100 per cent, 100 per cent of residential aged care facilities have been visited by InReach Clinic to deliver booster doses, Deputy President. We have provided surge workforce capacity. More than 80,000 shifts have been filled by surge workforce, including nurses, GPs, care workers, allied health workers, executive ancillary staff. The private health agreement in place to utilise private hospital staff. The furloughing changes made to minimise the loss of staff due to requirements to isolate. We have made sure, Deputy President, that in terms of PPE, we have seen more than 42 million masks, more than 15 million gowns, more than 43 million gloves, more than 12 million goggles, nearly 11 million rapid antigen tests delivered throughout, Deputy President, the aged care sector. We have made sure 50,000 treatments are sent out to aged care facilities across the country. Uh, ensuring that we prioritise those facing outbreak. Deputy President, Senator Keneally goes on. When are they getting their boosters? All facilities, all facilities have had the opportunity for people to have a booster. Senator Keneally, 
And Order. Senator Keneally, all facilities have had the opportunity for people to have a booster. It is not the case, Deputy President, that of course everybody will choose to have a booster. And people won't choose to have a booster because the reality is that some people in aged care are already Order. in palliative care. Some people in aged care are part of end of life management. It is a sad reality, but it's a true reality that those opposite are blinkered to, Deputy President. They ignore the fact that these truths exist and pretend there is some sort of alternate Order. universe. Even when we address the broader questions of aged care, Deputy President, this government, under Minister Colbeck and Minister Hunt, has provided an $18 billion response to the Royal Commission, a comprehensive response dealing with more places in home care, dealing with minimum standards in residential care, lifting those standards in a range of different ways. We have responded comprehensively to the Aged Care Royal Commission report, and our response contrasts with no response from those opposite, no response Senator aside Keneally. from the type of rubbish that is bowled up today, the type of politicisation that is bowled up today, rather than the acknowledgement of the challenges and the hard work of those who are helping this sector get Thank through you, some of the Birmingham. most challenging the time times. Has expired. Uh, just before I go to, uh, I'll go to Senator Rice, I do remind senators I was reluctant to uh, interrupt the minister mid-sentence, but I do remind senators he has the right, of, as does every senator, to be heard in silence, and I would ask you to respect that right. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. The Greens will be supporting this motion today because the Minister for Aged Services, Minister Colbeck, has failed. He has failed in his most basic of duties as a government minister, and that is to be keeping people safe. We are supporting this motion today because of the 587 people who have died in aged care in just the first five weeks of 2022, on top of all of the people who have died of COVID in aged care throughout 2020 and 2021. The minister has failed. There would have been fewer deaths of COVID of people in aged care if this government had been competent. They have failed in the vaccine rollout in aged care. They have failed to provide boosters to everyone in aged care who wanted to be boosters. They have failed to provide the PPE that workers and visitors in aged care homes need. They have failed provide to provide the rapid antigen tests that are needed. We have a situation where nurses and aged care workers are still having to, to pay for their own rat tests. They have failed to provide the adequate working conditions to support nurses and aged care workers to continue working in aged care. And then the men, and they have failed to, to provide that support so that we know that 20 per cent of nurses have said they want to leave working in aged care in the next year. And frankly, they have put in an amazing job that they have done over the last years, but I do not blame them because of the conditions they are having to be working under, because of the actions of this government. This minister has failed to do all of that, but of course he didn't fail to get to the cricket. Apparently that was a priority. And never mind that he earned more in that day that he went to the cricket than the aged care bonus that they have promised workers. So for the Greens, I want to say I am who, particularly to the families who are mourning and grieving for the people of their, who have, you've lost, we share your grief. And to the residents who are tired and frustrated and anxious and locked down in aged care homes, we hear your frustration. The aged care workers who are doing ceaseless hours, waiting desperately for the support and the recognition you deserve, we hear your anger. I mean, a minister may think that it's acceptable to go to the cricket while people die. We do not. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. And I will, uh, of course, be supporting uh, the motion moved by Senator Keneally today. And I think, uh, to start at the very top, there is no fundamentally greater responsibility for any government than to keep its citizens safe. It's there to protect every Australian. And what we have at the moment is a catastrophic failure of keeping elderly Australians safe. This minister and this government has been unable to do that. And there is no greater example of the shambles that is this government, their disunity and their infighting and the distractions 
taking away from actually dealing with the issues that everyday Australians face than is the crisis in aged care. The crisis in aged care that the Minister for Aged Care Services refuses to acknowledge there is a crisis. I mean, there is no that you cannot fix a situation if you don't acknowledge the crisis that is there right now. Everyone is saying it's a crisis. The workers in the sector, the families who have loved ones, individual residents are saying they've never seen the quality of care so poor as what they are experiencing right now. More than half of aged care facilities with outbreaks, thousands of staff, thousands of residents, 587 deaths since January—587 deaths in the last 39 days. And this minister's defence of that and, he, and Minister Hunt's defence of that is, oh, well, firstly, oh, well, you, you're old, so you're going to die anyway. And the second one is, oh, well, there's a lot of COVID out there, therefore, aged care, sorry, you're just going to get it, and unfortunately, because you're old, it's going to be more severe for you. Like we have had the benefit of seeing what's happened in the Northern Hemisphere for two seasons now. We saw what happened in Victoria. We understood the need to get vaccinated and get boosted and keep those facilities safe with PPE and testing and workforce. And here we are. We get another we get more widespread community transmission, and what do we see? Failures of PPE, failures of workforce, failures of testing, failures for people living in those facilities, isolated, dislocated, in their, in their dying moments, hoisted out of the facility and into hospital. And this minister went to the cricket. And I am sorry, minister, if you think I am misrepresenting this, but you told me you didn't want resources diverted away from dealing with what was happening in aged care. That's what you told me. I, I took that on face value. You, I didn't hold a hearing with your attendance and you popped up at the cricket. Yep. That is what happened. That is exactly what happened. You said you were too busy dealing with the crisis that you didn't come. And I think when you go outside and talk to people who are witnessing what's happening in aged care and, you, and they talk to me about that, they don't think it passes the pub test. So don't try and rewrite it. You made the decision to go to the cricket when aged care was in crisis. And, you, and this minister, who we are holding to account today, is not a new minister. Like, this minister took his first portfolio responsibilities in 2004. He has been Minister for Aged Care or Minister for Aged Care Services for the last two and a half years. It's not like you are learning the job. We've had report after report, an interim report from the Royal Commission titled Neglect. Someone has to take responsibility for this failure. This government won't take responsibility. The Senate must stand up and speak on behalf of all of the voices of people in aged care and the loved ones who are contacting my office, incredibly upset that they weren't able to be with their loved ones when they were passing away, when they were locked out, when they hear down the phone their loved one telling them that they haven't been showered and haven't eaten any food. That's the anger out there about aged care. You know, we are not playing politics with this. These are older Australians in their most vulnerable moment, and this government pretends that they've done everything they can and it's just a pandemic and Omicron came. Well, it's not good enough. And that's why this minister should Thank resign you, and the Gallagher. Prime Minister Your should sack him if expired. he doesn't. Thank you. Uh, Senator Roberts on this matter. Yes, please. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam, Acting, Madam, Madam Deputy President. So what will this achieve? Think about what's happening in, in my state, Queensland. Forced vaccinations by the federal government have driven aged care workers into resignation and they've abandoned their jobs after being heroes for 18 months. People crying, staff crying, because they don't want to leave 
people, residents in aged care facilities in the lurch, but they don't want to take that mandated injection. Look what else is happening in Queensland. Forced vaccinations in healthcare, destroying our hospital system. We have a so-called pandemic, which there's no pandemic of deaths, but we have a threat, apparently. And the response from the state government is to destroy its own health system. A Labor state government destroying health care. Nurses resigning. Nurses being left out because they don't want to get injected. And at the same time, we're told we're going to face an urgent hospital, an imminent hospital crisis. This doesn't make sense, neither the Liberal Party, National Party, nor the Labor Party. We have in Queensland, at a time when there's increasing load on the police to enforce capricious lockdown and other restrictions in Queensland, we're taking police off duty to do those jobs and at the same time standing aside police officers because they won't get injected. We're threatening people in our, in our emergency services workers, aged care, teaching, nurses, doctors, police, NDIS workers, fireys. We're threatening them with sacking them so they can't feed their kids because we're going to go against a 3,000-year-old principle of doctor-patient confidentiality, privacy and bodily autonomy. So it doesn't matter whether we look at this mob or this mob. You're both reckless and dishonest. So I ask you again, what will this achieve? The Labor Party is full of talk, but no action. You've got two or three months to an election. Where's your plan? Where is your plan? Instead of suspending, suspending the standing orders today, let's have your plan and put it to the people of Australia and let's see them decide at the next election who is competent to manage this country. Because at the moment, neither of you are. And that's why we keep saying to people, put the majors last. Because in 70 years, you have destroyed this country. Absolutely destroyed it. Giving in to the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, and now this rubbish. We will not be supporting the suspension of standing orders. There's an election. Let the people decide. The people right across this country. Senator Colbeck. President. Mr President, it is really disappointing that the Labor Party used this opportunity to Order. play politics with the pandemic rather than being constructive in actually dealing with it, Mr President. They talk about the Royal Commission, Mr President. They talk about the Royal Commission. It's nearly a year since the Royal Commission has brought down its final report, Respect, Care and Dignity. And yet, what is the plan for the, from the Labor Party to deal with aged care out of, out of the Royal Commission report? A comprehensive, a comprehensive report, which we have not only responded to every recommendation for, not only put over $18 billion on the table for the reform of the sector, but their response, their response, we'll spend more than the other model. That's it. That's all we get from Labor, Mr President. That's all we get from Labor. So they play their dirty, personal, nasty politics. That's what they do. That's what, their, that's what their whole plan is. We saw that before Christmas. That's what they do. Meanwhile, Mr President, as difficult as this is, and this is an extraordinarily difficult circumstance, it's not just a pandemic, Senator Gallagher. This is a global pandemic. We have a deadly virus. Uh, people will contract it throughout the community and, tragically, and tragically, some of them will die. Some of them will die. And we work from the Prime Minister down within this government every day in support of all Australians with respect to uh, the pandemic. Order. We took action early. Order. We took action early, Mr. President. We closed the borders. Order. We put the private hospital agreement in place to support the state health systems when they needed it, and they have needed it during January of this year through the Omicron outbreak. And of course, that private health Health, uh, our um, private health hospital agreement has also provided support for residents in aged care in the context of surge workforce and during 2020 in particular beds for residents who needed them. 
We've vaccinated the aged care population uh, in, in 2021, uh, and we commenced the vaccination program for aged care residents on the 8th of November last year, Mr. President. On the 12th of December, or thereabouts, we got advice to, to accelerate the program. On Christmas Eve, Mr. President, we got advice to accelerate it even further. The length, the period between vaccination and booster was shortened. We set out, which is what we were doing all through early January this year, we set out to bring forward the boosters for every facility in the country, and now every facility has received a booster, and we've started going around again, Mr. President. And we've started going around again. We've done over 130 facilities for a second site, Mr. President. And, Mr. President, Order. of those eligible for a booster, um, of those eligible for a booster, as of last night, 77.4% of residents have taken up the opportunity for a booster. And we continue to work in the interests of residents. We've, pro we've provided um, vaccines. We've provided. PPE throughout the program. Have there been some problems along the way? Yes, Mr. President, there have. Of course, there have. We had supply problems, supply chain problems earlier this year, which is what we were working out when the Senate wanted us to be there. When, when Senator Gallagher wanted us to be there on that morning, which is when the hearings were supposed to be, not while I was at the cricket, but that morning, we were working on bringing the vaccines forward, and we were oh, working nah. on ensuring that the vaccine that the, the, the rapid nah. antigen tests and the PPE required was getting to aged care facilities. Order. So have there been some issues there, Mr President? Yes, Mr President. So we continue to do that. So the Labor, can play, Labor Party can play their, their, their dirty, nasty personal politics, and we know that's their campaign strategy, but they have no plan. And why would you trust the mob that couldn't safely insulate your ceiling to run the response to a pandemic. Why would, you why would you trust them to do that? Could not build a school hall, Mr. President. How can they manage the recovery from a pandemic? How can they do that, Mr. President? We, from the Prime Minister down, have applied our attention to supporting Australians through the pandemic. We will continue to do that. Tragically, tragically some, of them, some Australians are going to catch the virus, and absolutely tragically, and we all know the impact of a personal loss. We all feel that. We've all, we've all felt that loss. We extend our condolences to all those that have suffered that loss, Mr President. But, but our focus will be on managing the pandemic while the, the opposition play politics with the pandemic. I will. I believe time has expired, but I'll just check. You have the call. Thank you, uh, Mr President. As other speakers from Labor have said today, older Australians deserve our respect, our support and our love. Instead, from this minister and this government, they get neglect, they get cuts and they get blame shifting and excuses. Instead of our respect and our support, they have a minister who presides over a rolling crisis, a crisis that has existed since he took on the role and has only got worse as we have faced COVID-19. Instead of our support and our respect, older Australians, their families, the aged care workforce get a minister who sees aged care as a part-time job, something he fits around his trips to the cricket. We have known about the horror stories in aged care for years. There was a royal commission into it, which exposed the neglect, which exposed the elderly Australians sitting with open wounds, unable to get the care that they need because of staffing shortages, because of underpayment of aged care workers, because of under-resourcing of the sector. We have known about this for years, and yet we continue to read about it, to hear about it, to watch it, to see it with our own eyes with our own families everywhere around the country. And rather than knuckle down and actually get these problems fixed, get the workers paid what they need to, to attract to people and keep people in the workforce, to make sure that providers use the funding they get transparently, 
so that the funds are used to support the elderly Australians in aged care facilities. Instead of that, and rather than knuckling down and fixing these problems, we have a minister who decides his priority is going to see a cricket match for three days. It's not as if time couldn't have been spent in those three days continuing to fix the problems in the aged care facility. There's no shortage of problems. There's no shortage of recommendations about what needs to be done. But instead, this minister chose to go to the cricket and let things rip. Just one example that we've turned to today, the Jetta Gardens aged, facility, aged care facility south of Brisbane. At the time this minister was at the cricket, COVID was ripping right through that aged care facility, and we now see 15 residents dead, as well as dozens more testing positive. This minister must go, and he Senator must Watt, go today. The time for the debate has now expired, so the question will need to be put. The question is that the suspension of standing orders be agreed to, as moved by Senator Keneally, I believe. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes, and Senator Chandler, teller for the noes. There being 28 ayes, 30 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. We will now return to the notice paper. And are there any uh, motions to take note of answers? I'll just give senators a moment to return to their seats. Those who are not participating in this debate, I would ask you to quietly clear the chamber and Senator Gallagher I'm giving you the call I believe thank you mr. president I move that, uh, to take note of answers to questions from myself uh, Senator Billick and Senator Watt uh, to Minister Colbeck um, thank you madam deputy president the crisis facing elderly Australians is out in our nursing home is hardly new for years now since well before the Royal Commission into aged care, We've been hearing heartbreaking and harrowing stories from constituents about exactly what it's like for residents and workers in this facility. Yet 22 reports and a Royal Commission on and Australia's most vulnerable have found themselves in the aged care sector's deepest and most profound crisis yet. And we have a minister in charge who simply doesn't turn up and do the job that the aged care sector needs him to do. I've been getting constituent um, feedback and from people reaching out telling me exactly how difficult it is in aged care at the moment uh, and how the response from government has been completely inadequate. The government would have you believe that nobody could see this coming, that there was no way that we could have protected people in residential aged care. Well, that is simply not true. I accept that this crisis hasn't been made by COVID-19 because the structural weakness in aged care has existed beyond that. And for the last eight years, heading into their ninth year, we've had a government that's paid lip service to aged care. They have refused after review after review to do anything. And then when it was reaching crisis point, this Prime Minister called a royal commission. In a way, it bought him another year to not fix the issues in aged care. And throughout that, those hearings, we heard again story after story about how the aged care system isn't able to deal with the pressures that exist. And one of the fundamental issues about that is the workforce, the fact that this government refuses to acknowledge that the aged care workforce is undervalued and underpaid. It would rather point the finger at Labor and accuse us of spending more money than them by supporting aged care workers than actually 
stumping up and putting a submission into the Fair Work Commission arguing for better wages for aged care workers. I mean, it is simply not tenable to retain a professional workforce and pay them less than you would pay my, teenage, my teenager to go and work on the weekend. I mean, they do the caring in these facilities. They are the ones that provide the meals, that clean the rooms, that clean older Australians. And this government thinks it's completely acceptable for them to exist on $22 per hour, to do the work of angels and to be the heroes of this pandemic. That is one of the biggest pressures facing the aged care system and one this government refuses to accept. It is one of the pressures that has caused the most um, challenges for elderly Australians in living in aged care during the pandemic, because the minute the workforce is out, the quality of care suffers. And that's what we've seen in thousands of aged care facilities right around the country. As workers got sick, this government's response was to change the criteria for how long they had to isolate. It was, oh, well, get back to work sooner once you've got rid of COVID, if you could, because we really need you in the workplace. It wasn't actually to deal comprehensively with the issues that these workers are facing or the stress they feel when they can't provide the care to the people that they look after. I have heard deeply distressing stories from workers who have gone and worked 16 hour shifts and been unable to spend time with people who are lonely and isolated and scared. The nature of the workforce means it attracts extremely caring people. So for that situation to be there every single day as they work extended shifts and double shifts and come back the next day after five hours sleep is deeply distressing to them. And this government is just disingenuous when it says it is dealing with the issues. It is not dealing with the issues. The sector has been in crisis for years. It's in complete crisis now, and the government doesn't have a long-term plan about how to address those challenges. And as long as they keep their head in the sand about workforce and the pay rates for aged care workers, nothing is going to improve at all. And that the people who pay that price are older Australians who Thank rely you, on those Senator services. Gallagher, your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Madam Deputy President, and I mean, I guess we couldn't all expect anything differently as we enter into an election year. Of course, the politicking, the smears, the constant creation of fear that all those on the other side have was what was set to continue and most likely escalate. And I think you know the last 45 minutes have demonstrated to us what all Australians who want to see this place achieve things can see is going to happen over the next couple of months. Stunts, smears and fear. It's all you've got. All the other side have to offer Australia. And we know as Australians are looking to come out from under the doona, Australians want government to get out of their life. They want their life to go back to normal. Australians are desperately hoping that their businesses can start to function as normal. Their kids can go to school as normal their job security, their social lives, everything that goes on around their kids and the sport that they play, the dance lessons, the rugby season, the cricket, all of that goes back to normal and parents can start to participate again. But not over there. No, no, no. No way we want Australians going back to any sort of normal life. And so today, the fear campaign is centred around aged care. And aged care has always been an incredibly difficult area of public policy. It has always been a very, uh, and I guess sad, part of the Australian experience in the Australian community. Because at the end of the day, when most Australians enter aged care facilities, and particularly high-need aged care facilities, we do know that this is not something they go into because they're in a great state of health. They don't go into these sort of situations because they're entering the prime of their life. They are not. It is absolutely at the sunset, hence why it's called the sunset time of life. And I know this because my mother's in an aged care home and has been in a high needs facility for four years. And because of 
the pandemic, I haven't been able to see her for over 12 months because no one is allowed in. Now, no one's allowed in. And as of today, 100 per cent of clinics have been offered a booster shot. 100 per cent of aged care facilities have been offered a booster clinic and had a booster clinic. Now, some of the reason why some people haven't had a booster shot is because the health wasn't able to take it at that point in time. They were on other medication that was advised for them not to receive that booster shot. But never let the truth of a situation get in the way of a smear campaign from those opposite. So we do want Australian families to be able to get be together. We do want Australian families to be able to spend time with their loved ones in aged care. But we do know, when we saw with Omicron, that it spread far more easily. But we also knew that people, when they got Omicron, showed very little symptoms, if any symptoms at all. In fact, for the vast majority of people, they didn't even know they had it, didn't even know they were positive with COVID. And this is another problem that we've got with a lot of the state governments and their reporting. They're obsessed, obsessed with how many daily cases of COVID there are. And then they start to talk about how many people are in hospital. And then they talk about the deaths from COVID. What they don't talk about is the fact that lots of women go into hospital every day to have a baby. And when they go into hospital, they're tested for COVID. And there's a remarkable number of them that didn't even know they were COVID positive, but they are then counted in the numbers. And then when we do see people unfortunately die, and I know those opposite might have forgotten this, but ultimately all of us, every single one of us in here is going to die. When people die and they happen to have COVID, not that they died from COVID, they could have died from cancer. They could have died from a gunshot wound to the stomach. But if they had COVID, they're counted as a COVID death. And this is just continuing to perpetuate the fear that you want to see Australians live under, because you don't like small business. You don't like family-run business. You love a government handout. You love boosting your union mates, making sure you can pay them all as much as possible, shutting down any entrepreneurial ship or Australian spirit of having a go. You want everyone hiding under the donor. We know that because the world's longest lockdown was your mate Dan Andrews, Premier of Victoria, who oversaw the longest lockdown in history. But guess what? Guess what we also saw last year? That federal government responsibility. It was only in Victoria that we saw that mass outbreak of deaths. The biggest deaths heard in Victoria, but in no way was this in relation to Victoria. This was nothing to do with Premier Andrews. I mean, he was probably too busy trying to deal with Adam Somurak and what happened with the red shirts, making sure IBAC and the Victorian police never looked into anything. Because you lot won't ever look into anything if it involves a Victorian Premier or a Labor Premier. When Palaszczuk had Queensland locked off, we know Western um, Australia Senator can't Hughes, even handle. Senator Hughes, please refer to uh, leaders in other parliaments by their correct titles. Thank you. Premier Palaszczuk can't handle it. it; just wants a lockdown, as does Mr. McGowan. Thank you. Shutting Your off time the world. has expired, Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I speak again today on one of the most serious issues that's confronting our country right now, which is the ongoing aged care crisis uh, that we see under the watch, on the watch of Minister Colbeck and the Morrison government as, as, as a whole. And as I was saying earlier, this is not a new crisis uh, that we have seen. This system has been in crisis for years, and it is a direct result of the cuts that Prime Minister Scott Morrison imposed on the aged care sector when he was the Treasurer only a couple of years ago. S tragically, the chickens are coming home to roost from the decision to cut aged care funding, and we see it every night on our nightly news programs. Uh, the neglect, um, the ill treatment, the staff shortages, um, the disgraceful situation which so many older Australians face each and every day. And of course, it has got worse following the COVID pandemic, following this government again dropping the ball failing to take responsibility for an area that is 100 per cent their responsibility, being aged care. We know that this Prime Minister and this Minister do everything they possibly can to blame shift, to blame other people, particularly state governments, whenever there's a problem that arises. This is one that they can't blame on other people because federal, uh, the federal government is 100 per cent responsible for aged care. They are 100 per cent responsible for their failure to make sure that we have the aged care workforce that we need as a country, to make sure that aged care workers are paid 
paid a decent wage so that they are attracted to working in the sector and remain in the sector uh, for years to come. It is 100 per cent this government's responsibility that they did not provide the PPE and the rapid antigen tests that aged care facilities needed as we opened up as a country and as Omicron raged across the country, particularly in aged care facilities. And tragically, we see the result of this government's failure to do its job uh, in aged care in the form of the 587 deaths that we have seen in aged care facilities just since 1 January this year. Now, this minister's performance in question time today, I think, made clear why he is not the man for the job. He seems to be living on another planet when it comes to what's happening in aged care at the moment. He tells us, on the one hand, that we have had 587 deaths since the 1st of January, but he won't admit that this is a crisis, even when his own Prime Minister does so himself. Uh, Minister Colbeck chooses instead to reel off all sorts of statistics to assure us that the situation in aged care is not as bad as we all think it is. Well, hello. As I say, what planet is he living on? Does he seriously think uh, that 587 deaths in aged care since the 1st of January this year is an acceptable result, especially when so many of those deaths arise from failures of this government to do its job to get the PPE into aged care facilities, to get aged age care residents boosted, uh, to get masks to get uh, rapid antigen tests into aged care facilities for residents and workers. That didn't happen, and we now see the consequences. Now, we also focused in question time on one particular example, the Jetta Gardens aged care facility south of Brisbane. Uh, now, that is something I've been paying close attention to as we've seen an outbreak rip through that aged care facility, and it has now cost the lives of 15 residents of that home. And there are about 180 residents and staff in total at that one home who have tested positive for COVID. There are alarming reports that have surfaced today in the media in Queensland uh, that there are severe shortage of masks for staff, even now at the end, uh, as, as this uh, outbreak has been going for over a month. Uh, uh, we have reports in the media today that staff have been told to only change their masks if they need to, because there is such a shortage of masks there. We learnt from the minister today that booster shots didn't even start in this facility until the 31st of January, one month after the outbreak began. One month of people catching COVID, dying from COVID, before booster shots even started. If that is not a great failure of responsibility from this federal government, I don't know what is. And possibly what makes it even worse, what we're seeing in the uh, Jetta Gardens facility right now, is that this government knew that there was a problem. Just last year, the government's own aged care regulator prepared two reports which said that this aged care facility was non-compliant in meeting aged care standards. It raised serious questions about the safety as residents. It raised serious concerns about the lack of a COVID outbreak management plan. But what happened? Again, this minister was asleep at the wheel and we see the tragic consequences in 15 people dying. He has got to go. This government has got to go once and for all. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, can I start my contribution to this debate by thanking the, the minister, Minister Colbeck, for his outstanding leadership in this difficult time in Australia and to um, push back on the uh, arguments by my honourable friend, Senator, Senator Watts. Uh, from the outset of the pandemic, aged care has always been and will remain a key focus of this government. The government fully accepts that it's, it's, it is distressing for families who have their members in aged care, particularly with the, with the consequences of state laws or state directives uh, preventing their loved ones from giving support. The Australian government has been using rapid antigen tests in aged care since last August, having delivered 9.5 million, and there are further deliveries underway to all facil facilities. This is in addition to over 1.5 million PCR tests that have been conducted. From the national medical stockpile, 42.9 million masks, 15.7 million gowns and 43.7 million gloves, 12.5 million goggles and face shields, and 190,000 bottles of hand sanitizer have been provided to aged care facilities. 
The Australian Defence Force is providing strategic logistical support to assist with the increased distributions to the aged care sector. And supporting the aged care workforce has always been a priority of this government, with more than 80,000 shifts having been filled by a surge of workforce provided by this government. This caring and well-led government, particularly under the Minister Colbeck. 100 per cent of facilities across the country have received a booster clinic. More than 76 per cent of eligible aged care residents have received a booster, which is above the national booster rate by more than 20 per cent. These are startling statistics which demonstrate in brutally and clearly the commitment of this government to support those in, our, in aged care. Uh, Madam Deputy President, the minister in his answer made reference to the $18 billion which the government has committed to the aged care sector following the Royal Commission. The government is supplying information to the Fair Work Commission to assist in its deliberations and has not yet been directed to clarify its position in relation to a wage increase. It is not fair to characterise the government as not committed to aged care workers. The government will provide $210 million to support the aged care workforce to continue to care for older Australians during the pandemic. A bonus of $800 will be made in two payments of up to $400 each and will be paid to aged care workers in government subsidised home care. The government has take, was, took the courageous decision to commission or to instruct a royal commission, and it has committed itself to the findings. The $18.3 billion committed is a once-in-a-generation change. No government before it has committed any more than this government into aged care. The government will be delivering record investment over the system Ford estimate and over the Ford estimates from $13.3 billion in 2012-13. This is such a significant amount and outmatches anything even conceptualised by the Labor government when last on the Treasury benches. Now, the Royal Commission, as, ref as referenced by the minister in his, in his answer, made 148 recommendations. The vast majority have been accepted and implementation is underway. The government's response is a f includes a five-year implementation plan underpinned by five key pillars. Home care, supporting Australian, Australians who choose to remain in their home. Residential aged care services and sustainability, improving and simplifying residential aged care services and access. Residential aged care quality and safety, improving residential aged care quality and safety. Workforce, and supporting a better skilled and growing Thank you, workforce. Senator McLaughlin, your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, the President. Well, in question time today, Senator Colbeck has again failed to acknowledge that there is a crisis in aged care. He has failed to acknowledge that we are in a state of emergency in aged care today. Uh, and he has failed in his most fundamental and basic duty, and that is to keep our most vulnerable elderly Australians safe. He has failed. He has failed and he should go. This minister has ignored report after report and warning after warning from experts for too long. He has ignored the calls for help from workers, from residents, from providers, from families for too long. He has simply ignored his responsibility as a minister for too long. And Australians, they have waited far too long for the Prime Minister to sack this incompetent minister. Never forget that as this crisis unfolded, 
when aged care residents were locked in their rooms, when aged care residents were going without food and going without water, when aged care residents were going without basic care, this minister took himself off to the cricket for three days. For three days, he enjoyed the cricket while aged care residents suffered, while aged care workers worked back-to-back 14-hour -back shifts. This minister thought it was appropriate, thought it was acceptable to take himself off to the cricket, not for just one day, for three days, three days, right at the time when aged care residents were going hungry, right at the time when aged care residents were dying. It is a complete disgrace. This minister must go. He must resign, and if he won't, the Prime Minister must sack him today. There is one thing that I can agree with on Senator Colbeck's comments today in question time, uh, and that is that this is perhaps no longer a crisis anymore, because we've gone past that, and this is an absolute catastrophe. It is a full-blown catastrophe, and it is a catastrophe that has not just occurred during COVID, has not just occurred during the pandemic. It is a catastrophe that has been nine years in the making. It's a catastrophe that aged care workers have been warning us about for years. And you only need to talk to those workers to know exactly what is going on in aged care today. And that is why Senator Colbeck and the Prime Minister should have gone outside today and spoken to the ANMF members who were here today to tell their stories. These are the workers who were trying in the most difficult of conditions to protect and keep our vulnerable aged care residents safe. Unlike Minister Colbeck, unlike the Prime Minister, I listened to their stories today. I listened to what they've heard over the past few months, what they've seen over the past few months, and what they said is that they are simply drowning. They said they've been underwater in aged care for a long time under this government, and today they are simply drowning. They were treading water last year. Right now they're underwater and they are overwhelmed. There are no staff to fill the shifts that need to be filled. They are exhausted. They are burnt out. And they are heartbroken because what it means for them on a day-to-day -day basis is that they are running between rooms trying to make decisions about who to help, whether to get someone off the floor or whether to go to a dementia patient who's in distress. These are the decisions that are facing aged care workers today because the minister will not do his job because he can't make the right decisions to keep our aged care workers and our aged care residents safe. Our aged care workers are making heartbreaking decisions, and what they want is just the time. They just want the staff. They just want to be there for people. They want to hold their hands in their last moments, to listen to their stories, to give them the care and the dignity they deserve. Instead, people are being locked in their rooms, isolated, lonely and distraught because of the failures of this minister, because of the failures of this government. Thank you, Senator Walsh. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to take note of the answer provided by Minister Birmingham in relation to politicians' travel allowance. Yeah, and Senator Lambie, you don't need to seek leave. It's your, your opportunity just to take note. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. 75 of the people sitting in parliament today own investment homes up here. 33 of them are Labor politicians and 42 are coalition. It's a scam. The public is paying nearly $2 million a year for politicians to sleep in their own beds. It has to stop. And it happens on the quiet and nobody ever talks about it. It's don't ask, don't tell, don't worry. Politicians are quietly squeezing free money out of taxpayers to line their own pockets thanks to loopholes in the travel allowance rules in Canberra. When politicians have to travel for work, they have to stay in a hotel or a motel 
and they're paid a travel allowance to cover their room and their food. You're only paid this if you're staying in commercial accommodation. If you're staying with a mate, you're not paying for a place to stay. So you shouldn't get travel allowance. Pretty straightforward, hey? Well, that's not how it works here if you're in Canberra. Oh, no. In Canberra, you get paid nearly $300 a night to stay wherever you like. You get it tax-free. Doesn't matter if you're sleeping at a hostel or the Hyatt. You're getting $300 a night from the taxpayer. They say Canberra's a bubble, and they might be right. Because there's only one place in the country where you can charge everybody else to sleep in your own home. It doesn't matter if you sleep in a hotel. It doesn't matter if you stay at your mate's place. It doesn't even matter if you stay in your very own apartment. You can sleep in the comfort of your own bed and you still get the same amount, nearly 300 bucks every night when you're in Canberra. This rule, as I've said, only applies in Canberra. How convenient. Nowhere else in the country do we pay politicians to have a mortgage. Nowhere. 75 politicians are charging you people out there over $20,000 tonight alone. All that money goes straight into their own pockets, not to mention the money that they make out of it once they sell that housing property at the end of when they're finished up here. So they buy a unit, they leave it empty for half the year, then they come to Canberra for all sittings and they charge us all to cover their mortgage. They make more than $1,000 every sitting week, tax-free, tucked up in their pyjamas. And that's not including if they stay the weekend and don't go home. There are Australians out there who can't even afford to pay their rent each week, let alone buy their first home. And we've got pollies giving themselves taxpayers' money to pay for their second one. Taxpayers are footing the bill for their mortgage, but the pollies keep the profits at the end. It is wrong. It is a rort. There is no reason for regular Australians to be paying for wealthy politicians to own investment properties in Canberra. Or should I say there's at least no good reason for that? Because clearly there are 300 reasons for every one of the politicians, Liberal and Labor, who are happily jumping through the loophole to stay in their fancy, fancy Canberra flats this evening. They, won't, they don't want to tell you that, though. They'll never admit that. Ask any politician up here why they should get nearly 300 bucks to sleep in their own homes, and they get pretty sheepish about that. Let me tell you. Look at Minister Birmingham this afternoon. Look at the opposition leader, who must have been pretty embarrassed to say he won't do anything to fix this rot last week, maybe because he knows he'll get called out for raking in some tens of thousands of dollars as well. And what do they say when you ask them about it? This is what their excuse is. It's within the rules. So what? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. The rules let you rip off taxpayers. So you're OK with that. I don't care about what the rules say, because if the rules allow wild-scale rotting, the rules are wrong. The rules are a bad example. Go ask anyone down your electorate. It doesn't pass the pub test. It honestly takes my breath away that anyone would have the stomach to sell themselves out for extra cash on taxpayers' dime. The money isn't even the worst bit, though. It's the attitude. Kickbacks to politicians happen because Liberal and Labor parties write the rules for themselves. The, act, the government acts like taxpayer money is fair game for politicians to rot, and there is no opposition because they're in on it too. Both them with their snouts in the, both them with their snouts in the trough. What's new? Public money is for the public. It's not for your mortgage. It's money that's supposed to be going to aged care workers, rapid tests and homes for people who can't afford them. The big parties have ripped off taxpayers for so, for so long, it's like they can't see the problem anymore. But they're defending the indefensible, and they know it. They have to stop thinking it's OK to write their own rules in a way that suits them, because Australians aren't going to put up with it for much more. For goodness sake, find your conscience and fix it. Here, here. Senator Lambie, the motion. Thank you. The motion before the chair is uh, that we take note uh, of the answer given by Senator Birmingham. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it.